The second topic that we're going to talk about in our first session is using research resource identifiers or RRIDs. These are unique persistent identifiers that make it easy for others to determine exactly what resource you use to complete your, your research. There are two websites that you might find helpful in completing this section of the workshop when we're in class on Friday. The first of these is the RRID portal, and this is a website that you can use to look up existing RRIDs or create new RRIDs. I've given the link here, but you can also easily find this by doing a Google search for RRID portal. The second site that you may find useful is called SciScore, and there's a link here as well, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the session. Okay, so before we get into RRIDs, I want to talk a little bit about some ways that you can enrich your publication with additional materials to make it more transparent and reproducible, and RRIDs are one of the things on this list. So we'll start off with our standard publication, and most of us are very familiar with this. We know that it has an introduction, a materials and method section, a results, and a discussion section. However, there are some additional pieces that we can add to this to give readers and our future selves more information about what was done and to make our work more transparent and reproducible. The first thing that we can do is provide a detailed materials list. And so here we can do this by reporting RRIDs or research resource identifiers for model organisms, antibodies, cell lines, plasmids, or software and tools that were used within the method section of your paper or within a STAR methods table if you're submitting to a journal that uses the STAR methods table format. And you also might include identifying information like antibody lot numbers or software versions. The next thing that you might be able to add is access to new materials. So some of you will create new materials during your research. This might include plasmids or cell lines or mouse lines um, or something else of a nature that, that you've created that's unique and used for your experiment. One thing that you can do is deposit your new non-commercial materials or organisms in a repository to preserve access for future generations. And this means that the repository takes over the role of maintaining that thing going forward so that others can go to the repository to get it instead of coming to your lab. And there are a variety of different repositories that you might use depending on what type of resource that you've created. The next thing you can do is provide a detailed protocol of your methods. So we know that method section off, sections often lack essential need, details needed to complete an experiment. And so it's possible to publicly share step-by-step -step protocols on a pro protocol repository like Protocols.io or Protocols Exchange. And we'll be talking about how to do this in a future session. When you're doing this, you want to include RRIDs in your protocol for the methods or for the materials that you use so that others can use those same materials. And then you want to cite the protocol that you followed in your paper. The next thing that you can do is add data and a data dictionary. So you can deposit your data in a public repository so that others can reuse them. And whenever you're doing this, you want to include a data dictionary with variable names, units, and possible values for each variable in the data set. You want to include some basic metadata, for example, information about the sample design or how the, or the experimental design or how your samples were collected, and also a license specifying how the data can be reused and under what conditions and how the creators of the data should be credited. And you can search re3data or fairsharing.org to identify repositories. There are two different types of repositories. Specialist repositories are designed for specific types of data, whereas generalist repositories like Zenodo, OSF, and Figshare are designed for any type of data that you might generate. And the last thing you might provide is code for analysis. So you might share the code that you used to analyze your data to allow others to run that same code on your data and reproduce the results. And you can integrate your data and code into a container to allow readers to rerun the analysis using appropriate versions of all relevant software packages.
This last step won't be something that we'll discuss in this course, but there are certainly other courses where you can find more information about how to do this, as well as many online materials. Okay, so our main topic for today deals with that first step of providing more information, the detailed materials list, and in particular, RRIDs. So let's talk about what is an RRID. An RRID is a research resource identifier. So this is a unique persistent identifier that tells others exactly what you used. RRIDs are not available for everything, but they are available, val available for specific categories of things. And those categories are software and tools, model organisms, antibodies, cell lines, and plasmids. So here's an example of what I might see if I looked up this particular antibody in the RID portal. I would get a link to the website where that antibody um, is, is found or is available. I would see information on how to cite this antibody. So this would be the information I would include in my paper after the name of the antibody. So the supplier catalog number and then the RID. And there's also some notes about the applications. Um, there may or may not be references and host organism clonality targets. This additional information may differ depending on the type of resource that you enter. So why should we report RRIDs in our manuscripts? How are these things useful? Well, the reason is that others can't implement your methods or extend your work if they're not sure what you used. And this is an example of this from my own work. Um, we noticed that amongst papers using animal models to study preeclampsia, some of them were reporting very high concentrations of VEGF in rats and others were reporting unmeasurable concentrations. And all of them were using kits from R&D systems, so we couldn't really determine why. And so we did a systematic study and what we found was that while all of these kits, all of these studies were measuring in rats, some of them were using the rat kit from R&D system and others were using a mouse kit. And those studies that were using a rat kit found unmeasurable VEGF concentrations, where those studies using the mouse kit found high VEGF concentrations. So here was a difference in what was being used that was having a clear impact on the type of data that people were generating. Um, and it wasn't obvious, there wasn't enough information in the publications to determine what was going on and why we were seeing these vastly different levels. So what we want you to remember here is that others can't implement your methods or extend your work if they don't know what you use. So reporting the RRIDs is like giving an ingredients list for your paper. Readers will be able to tell exactly what you use, even if that supplier's website or catalog number changes. If the supplier adds similar products or maybe renames the product that you were using, or if the product was discontinued, the reader will still be able to find the RID and information about what that product was, even if it's no longer available. It's important to note here that an increasing number of journals are requiring or asking authors to use RIDs as well. Using RRIDs benefits future use. So researchers often want to go back to protocols that they've used in the past. And while you know exactly what supplies you're using right now, five years from now, you or someone else in your research group may find that things have changed. Maybe your supplier was brought by another company, um, the website and catalog numbers are all different, new products added with similar names, et cetera and it's hard to determine what happened to your resource. RIDs make it easy to find out whether your resource is still available and to access it through current suppliers so you don't waste time searching for your resource or selecting and validating something new because you can't determine what you were using. So you might be thinking, we already report things like antibody name and catalog number or lot number and supplier, Isn't these, aren't these things sufficient? Um, and again, we would argue that they are also important information to report, but they're not a substitute for the RRID. So catalog numbers and software versions, et cetera, these are very useful to enhance transparency, but they don't replace the RRID. Again, with the RRID, readers will be able to tell what you use, even if the research name or description no longer um, it has changed on the supplier website or the website has changed or the product has been discontinued. 
And our IDs are also easy to track in automated ways, making it easier for our resource creators to get credit for their work. How do you look up an RID? Uh, this is quite straightforward. You're going to go to the RID portal website. And when you go to that website, you just want to enter information about whatever it is that you're looking for. Um, it can be helpful to have you know, the specific name of the item if you're searching for something common. Sometimes it can be helpful to try entering the website. Um, the catalog number can also be very helpful for looking up current resources to see if the thing that you have is already in the system. It's not so much a problem for uncommon things, but for very common things where there may be many competing entries, those additional details can be helpful in finding the thing that you're looking for. So how do I enter RIDs into my manuscript? Well, you simply look at the Cite This portion and it will tell you, you know, exactly what you should include in the parentheses after you mention your thing. And so here again, we have the supplier name, the catalog number, and the RID. You want to insert the RID in parentheses after the name of the thing. So here's another example. Analyses were performed using SPSS version 25, parentheses, the RID. The RID, you always need to have the RID colon part. Um, the reason for this is that it identifies this particular thing as an RID, which makes it easier for readers to tell what it is and search in an online way. There's always a colon after an RID. There should never be a space between the colon and the next letter. The next two letters or three letters, depending on the database, will enter indicate the database that the thing came from. In this particular case, it's an antibody from the antibody registry. And then there will be an underscore followed by the number of that thing in the database. And that's always a unique number for every different thing. So you might be wondering, do I really need to include RID colon at the beginning of every RID? And yes, you do. Every RID should always start with RID colon. This immediately tells readers that the thing they're seeing is an RID. So it's important to remember that the codes are different for every database. So readers may not recognize an RID if it comes from a database that they don't use. So for example, the RIDs for antibodies start with AB, for software and tools, they start with SCR and so on and so forth. Um, the software that tracks the RIDs also uses the search term RID colon, which is very unique and makes it easy to find these things. And if this is missing, then the number of errors increase and it's hard to track which papers or how many papers are using specific resources. Can I put RIDs in my supplementary tables? We don't recommend this. We encourage you to put them in your main methods. Um, supplemental files, again, are very difficult to track automatically using bots and other automated tools. And so when you put your RIDs in the supplement, it's hard to determine which resources your paper used, which then means that we don't know that your paper used something and resource creators don't get credit for their work. If you are submitting to a journal that uses STAR methods tables, then this is where they want you to put the RIDs in that STAR methods table. And for those of you who aren't familiar with STAR methods tables, these are tables that list all key resources that were used in a particular research study. So what if you find that your resource doesn't have an RID? Well, that's okay. You simply click, click the add a resource button to add your resource to the database. When you click on add your resource, you'll have to choose the type of resource that it is, and this will help to get it into the correct database. Um, and then you will, once you've selected the resource type, then you can add the relevant info that is requested and submit your resource. You should receive an email within a few days listing the RIDs after the resource is approved. Can I get an RID for a resource that I created in my lab? Yes, you can. So if you have made something new, then you can get an RID for it, whether it's software or perhaps a mouse line. You want to submit that thing through the RID portal. And you can also, once you get the RID, um, link that, go into the RID portal and claim ownership of that item. And then that resource will get linked to your ORCID profile. So it will show up in your ORCID profile that you've created this resource as well. What about software and tools? Okay, 
The first question to address here is what counts as software and tools. So you do not need an RID if you're creating code that's not likely to be reused. So for example, let's say you wrote code to analyze your specific data set and probably someone's not going to be able to reuse it for other purposes, then you don't need to get an RID. However, if you created a software tool or wrote code that is planned and intended to be used by others and designed to be used by others, that's when RIDs are most important. So maybe you create a software tool that helps researchers make a specific type of graph, or your code is implementing an algorithm for analyzing data obtained using a common imaging technique. In both of these cases, you could get an RID for your software or your code. Um, and when you publish your code or software, you might want to include the RID on your tool or on your repository where you tell others how to cite their resource, as well as in the publication introducing the resource. And this again, if people are citing the RID, it will make it very easy to track who has used that resource and how many people have used that resource, which can be very helpful for you tracking the impact of your work. How can RIDs improve my research? So I already mentioned that it makes it easier for future you to go back and figure out what exactly you used. But the other important thing to note here is that the RID portal includes warnings about problematic resources. So some example of these, there are cases where the same antibody is offered by different suppliers under different catalog numbers. Those things have the same RID. So you will know that even though these two antibodies that I'm using are sold by different companies, they have the same RID and they are actually the same antibody. The other example is cell lines. Um, and there are two potential issues with cell lines. One is that they can be misdiagnosed. So they came from a person, a patient. And it was it's possible that that patient was not diagnosed correctly at the time. And so the cell line was labeled as something when it was actually something different. Um, the other issue is cell lines that have been contaminated. And so here's an entry, for example, for a particular cell line. And I can see here there's a comment that it's a problematic cell line because it is contaminated. It's shown to be an M14 derivative. And then also that there was a misdiagnosis issue. So it was originally thought to be from a breast carcinoma, um, whereas it's actually, an amen <clears throat> it's actually from a form of melanoma. And so these are both things that would be really important to know to make sure that I'm using that cell line correctly, or since it's contaminated, I would perhaps want to replace it with a different cell line. So you want to look up RIDs to find warnings before you start your experiment, and then include RIDs in your protocol and also use them when you're writing your manuscript. So you might be thinking, I have a lot of things that require RIDs, and I don't have time to look them up one by one. Well, this is where you might want to use a tool called SciScore, um, and the website link is here. If you click on Get Started, you can register for free using your ORCID profile, and then you can copy and paste your method section and run that through the tool. And you can screen, I believe, 10 papers each year for free. And you'll get two tables back. The second of those tables will suggest RIDs for resources that it finds. So for example, in this sentence, it found two different antibodies. And one is something that it thinks it recognizes it. So it suggests an RID. And then the second is something that it doesn't seem to recognize. So you might need to enter that into the RID portal. And then in the second one, it's also identified two different antibodies in the second sentence, um, and it suggested RIDs for both things. So you could confirm that this is correct, and then it might save you quite a bit of time in preparing your method section. And I mentioned you get two tables back from the tool. The tool also looks at other things. So you'll get a second table that looks at other factors related to reproducibility. So things like, did it find an institutional review board statement? Um, if it was an animal experiment or an ethics or consent statement for human experiments, is there information about whether your experiment was randomized or blinded, whether a power analysis was performed, whether the sex of your participants or animals or samples was specified, and whether cell line authentication was performed. 
So our activity for the workshop is going to be to enter our IDs in your methods section. Um, you will want to put in our IDs for the types of key resources that we discussed. And you might want to start with something that's simple and easy to identify, like your statistical analysis software. And the other thing you can do is request RIDs for resources that you have which don't include an RID. And then some of you want to try, may want to try running your method section through SciScore to see what items are missing. Um, and we would also be happy to answer questions about other things that you find in that SciScore table if you have questions about how to address those things as well. So, I'd like to thank you all. Um, that's the end of today's session, and we look forward to seeing you in the workshop.